good to be here. And I love you. I remember standing up on that corner of the balcony when it was just steel ribs. And this was all just a flat roof. The steel been going up. And I think of all that went into it. I didn't build this church. Everything that happened that was good while I was here was the Lord and was with you people. And the different gifts. I don't want to start mentioning names because I'll leave people out. But uh, I think Dick Pritchard put a needle in my back. We had um, Coconut come out. Jim Coconut moved to the NC alone and met the board. And I'm going to start from this minute. I'm going to let you out before 12. <laughs> I can do it. But uh, the board said that's a good idea, but I don't think this is the time. And Dick said, after about six months, Rush, you got to push up again. And he came out and gave us a, a speed of our design, direct dollars, and desire. We had a big board, 21 people, and it was 20 to 1 that we could go ahead. And that night, that one called and said, you know, count the unanimous. And if anybody didn't have as much as that one, did after that, well, go on. Teach too much. I remember as we were building this, at the end of the Carter administration, the prime rate went to 20%. 20% we had to borrow. And uh, Bob Bollinger, in his gift, took me by the hand around to 12 different banks, and I just pretended like I knew what was going on. <laughs> And he'd say, could you loan us $25, I mean $25,000 at 12%. And he got us a consortium loan. I don't know how in the world we would have floated that mortgage. But just things like that, God has been good. When I came here, I was amazed that you called me. I <laughs> have stayed 22 years. I walked out on the platform down below the first day. I was never intimidated. I felt like I was coming home. There's one person that intimidated me, was the first doc, pastor that we had here, Dr. J. Glenn Gould. Any, how many remember Dr. Gould? See, there's a few of you. Dr. Gould was the most dignified. He wore a tight of breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> but he'd been dead quite a few years before I came here. I used to leave the singing for him on Sunday nights when this basement was first built. And uh, I came out that little door at the side and sat down, and Dr. Gould, his ghost, came out right behind me. <laughs> and he looked over at me and he said, Hello, what are you doing here? <laughs> and he scared me so bad that I preached that sermon nine minutes flat. <laughs> and the people said, Who in the world do we call this pastor? and 
eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Bear in mind who he was talking telling them. And skipping down to the 13th verse, there was a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together with all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his health, his wealth, and wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his belly with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father put his hand on his mouth and tried to be quiet. Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate it. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost in his found. So they began to celebrate, just like you're doing this morning. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother came home, he replied. Your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. If you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fat calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. It's the gospel of the Lord. Father, we thank you for your presence. We pray that you'll speak to us this morning. Have your way. Amen. Please be seated. This great story is a story about homecoming. It's not, it's the story of the prodigal son. It's listed that way in my Bible. But it's not just about the one that went away. This story, great story, tells us a number of things. The first thing that sticks out to me is that you can come home again. No matter where you've been, or who you are, or what you've done, the Father loves you. He wants to welcome you home. There's a thousand ways for us to go away from home. 
Faith isn't something that we do. Faith is a response to the love of a Heavenly Father. I think as I have gotten older, I know a lot less than I used to know, for sure. And I, I love our Western Armenian Methodist doctrine with all my heart. And I believe in it. But beyond doctrine and behind the theology and underneath all that we can learn here, there's a relationship that calls out to us. A God that loves us where we are. And I'm so glad you don't have to be like me. You don't even have I'm a Nazarene until I die, okay? Even though I've got some Methodist friends here, and I sojourned in their church for a number of years, and with great fellowship. But you don't even have to be a Nazarene in order to come home. But you have to turn your heart toward home and realize that there's a God out there that loves you. And I started to say, in my old age, I, I, a lot of things I used to know for sure, I'm not quite so sure about anymore. In my age, in my lifetime, the universe has gotten a lot bigger. I think when I went to school, the sun was the center of, the, of our universe, and the, and the Milky Way galaxy was about as far as it went. And then they put a telescope out there, a Hubble telescope, and they find out that our galaxy is not so big after all. And our sun looks awful puny next to some other. If I keep doing this, I'll not get down to 12 o'clock. <laughs> but you hear what I'm saying? There's a lot more than we can ever know. But there's some things that I've, I've come to believe for sure. Two things. God is good. A lot of times when I say that, they call it back all the time when I say, yeah, all the time God is good. But think about that. In spite of the newspapers, in spite of what's going on in the Horn of Africa, in spite of the Middle East power game, God is God and God is good. And the other thing, put this in your heart, God loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, God is good. And God loves you. And He's calling you to faith. Faith isn't something that you believe against belief. And we know it's not true, but you're going to believe it anyway. But faith is hearing that call that came there in the third chapter of Genesis, where God called to Adam and said, Adam, where are you? And Adam said, I've been sinful. I got these big leaves on. They don't quite cover me up. I'm naked. And God said, I want to walk with you. And you know that call is still going out today. God is calling your name. And every one of us has been in the place of this fellow that said, you know, I'm, I'm sick of myself. I'm sick of my ways. And I want to be really alive. And I'm going to turn my face toward God. The minute you turn your face toward God, He knows it. And that life begins. Home is a person and a family, and faith is a response. I like that quote, faith is a center, personal, relational response in trust and obedience. It's centered in Jesus and what he's done. We know that story. It's personal because Jesus won't let you go. He knows your name. It's relational because it brings us into the family of God. But it is a response. If God doesn't call us, if He doesn't give us that faith, we're lost. The story also sadly tells us that you can be lost without ever really going away. Jesus told this story to people that knew the Old Testament by heart. He told it to the religious teachers who trusted in what they knew and didn't have a heart relationship. Jesus was telling this story, and I think they got it. And the story that's got the bite of the story comes at the end. It's kind of an unfinished story. I see it in my mind's eye. The sun's already set, and uh, this big old house is outlined in darkness, and you can see the lights shining out the windows, and you can hear the glasses tinkling in there, and they're dancing. They must not be dancing for me. But anyway, <laughs> Well, old-fashioned, that's right. <laughs> but the, the doors open and the light.
sun shining out and there's two men out, out in the front yard talking. And if you look at them closely, they look alike, a lot alike light because it's a father and a son. And the father said, why don't you come out here and having a party? And the son said, well, you know why I'm not going in there. He's in there. I don't want to go in with him. Yeah, but he's your brother. Yeah, but look what he did. He did all these terrible things. And now you're making a party for him. And then comes this verse that haunts me. The father puts his arm around that old son and says, Son, you know something? You are always with me, which means I am always with you. And all that I have is yours. And you never realize it. Come on in. And that's where the story ends. You get, it, Jesus kind of left it there. And you know, that puts us there too. Because I think sometimes I've been in that role of the, of the upper brother. And I realize I'm an Azure. And all from my youth, I kept the rules. And I go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, all. And maybe forgotten that there are people that don't keep the rules and are way out there and are coming back. Who was it that said what's wrong often with the American evangelicals is that they have a loving father gospel and an elder brother theology. And I pray that that won't be the case. I don't think it's the case here. I felt the welcome of the Lord. That's the important thing. That we welcome him in our, into our presence. This unfinished story, this homecoming story, is a hint of a homecoming that God's presence now assures us that one day we'll all be here with him. I asked if they'd throw a picture up there for you. Henry Don, who's a favorite author of many of you, wrote a little book about this story. Is it up there? Yes. There it is. You can see it a little bit. It's called The Return of the Prodigal. And in that picture are four individuals. There's the loving father. There's the prodigal. Once you walk, once you want, you can't see it in detail there. And over to the right, there's that elder brother looking on and saying, What? How can he love him? Can he love him like that? You can't see it in the, in the background. There's an observer just looking on, observing, taking notes. And Henry Nolan says, At one time or another, probably we have been in the part of every one of these four characters. Maybe there's times when you've been able not to be God the Father, but to welcome somebody, give them the word, and say, you know, God loves you. I hope that that is your privilege of mine from time to time. We've all been the, the prodigal. And some time to time we have to keep coming back, too. Not that we backslide and lose our soul, but we're welcome. But God forbid us for, for being that elder brother. It's about four minutes to twelve, and I'm almost done. But I want to pray with you. And just leave this story with you. It's unfinished. But let's come in to the homecoming. Father, thank you for the story that Jesus told us. Thank you for the fact that we're welcome in your presence. And oh God, we pray that you will call to us and let that hunger, let that hunger come to a focus and realize that our faith needs to be centered in you. Needs to be personal. Needs to bring us into the family of God. Let it be so, we pray. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask for the privilege of closing my way today. And uh, I remember a song we used to sing. You know, I used to live to sing it in this church before I walked. They paid me $13 a week. <laughs> And I had to take care of the junior high kids, too. <laughs> <laughs> We're all all grandparents. Dickie Man and Bobby Man and, uh, and all that. That was, that was a long time ago. But from that time and even before the college, this used to be the college church. By the way, don't forget your college church. And then my... <laughs> well, we used to sing one song that really I love to sing. I thought if I could die and go to heaven, I had to have one moment to be frozen in all eternity. It might be sitting on the platform here and listening to you sing. But there's a song, it's number 554 in your hymn book. Sing all the verses. And when we come to the third verse, 
And uh, for uh, those of you who have not had the privilege of hearing Pastor Metcalf preach because you're new to the church, I hope you will sense a, a strong connection to what God has done in the past and what God continues to do today and what He's going to do in the future in this great church. Because God is not done with us yet. Amen? Amen. Amen. And there are great days ahead because we are putting our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Pastor, for reminding us of that today. Leave some prayer, would you please? Let's pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for the invitation to come home. Thank you for your great love that has extended to each and every one of us and has blended us together into your family. We're great to be grateful to be your people and to be welcomed home. We ask your special blessing on each person gathered here today. Thank you for the privilege of being in the presence, your presence, and sensing you here and speaking to us. And as we go, may we sense your presence going with us. May your blessing be upon Russ and Helen and all of their family, each one of them, and each and every one of us who are part of the family of God. And we pray your special blessing on this church, these people, this school. Thank you again for your wondrous blessing and presence. In Jesus' name. Now would you receive this blessing, these ancient words. May the Lord bless you, and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you, and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in his grace and his peace. Together again someday, we'll see Jesus. Lord bless you. Thank you so much for coming today.